Um, look at verse 9 where we left off. I'm going to read a few verses here and we'll get into our study here. Uh, Titus chapter 3 <clears throat> and verse number 9. Paul says, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. When you look at what the Apostle Paul starts off as we were going about the grace of God, he tells us the positive last week. Look at verse eight, Titus chapter three, verse eight. He says, this is a faithful saying. We, we, we went over this. He says, in these things, I will that thou affirm constantly. So the thing that the ministers to constantly affirm or strengthen in the believers is they that they which have believed in God. If you believe in God, if you've trusted Christ. God has something for us to do. He says, you might be careful, full of care. Most of the time, Paul says, don't be careful, right? Be careful for nothing as far as worry. But in this, he wants you to be careful, take good care to do what? To maintain good works. Just your attendance here, those who are watching by way of the internet, just your attendance here or your investing in the ministry as far as time, treasure, talents, that's part of these good works that you can maintain. It's a maintenance program, right? He says that they maintain good works. And why? These things are good, both good, it's good to do these things, but there's profit involved. But on the other hand, so you got the things that are profitable, right? Paul, we, I talked about this all the time. Paul is looking for profit. Paul was a businessman, but not the profit that the world looks for, the riches of this world. He's looking for spiritual profit, okay? He says that uh, spiritual profit. He said that godliness is profitable for the life which is now is and that which is to come. But on the other hand, there's things that are unprofitable. And what businessman wants to be unprofitable? They want the bottom line. They want a profit. So if there are things that are lead to your profits being diminished, don't do them. That's why he st starts at verse 9. Look at verse 9. He said, but avoid. You got the, un you got the profitable things. But on the other hand, you got the other things. Look at verse 9. But avoid foolish questions. The first thing he says is foolish questions. I love questions. I love them. I, it, it's my life's blood because it challenges me. I, lo I love open q and I, 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 I mean, I love it. If I could have a radio show four, days, uh, uh, four hours a day just sending me questions, I love it. But there are certain questions that are just stupid. That's that word foolish. I'm just going to be honest with you, okay? I'm from the hood. It's stupid. And when people ask stupid questions, because they're not sincere, they don't really want to know the truth of God's word. They just want to argue with you. That's right. Argue and debate with you. And Paul's going to tell you, don't get involved with that nonsense. I've, I've been asked thousands upon thousands of questions in 20 years plus in ministry. I can tell by the question and the questioner whether it's sincere or not. I don't even waste my time with those who who aren't sincere. I got, I got a stack of questions every day waiting for me to answer and stuff, so forth. So if I get one or two who just want to fight and battle, I don't even answer. I mean, what's the point? Notice Paul says foolish questions, stupid. Oh, foolish questions, stupidity. You know how some people say there are no dumb questions or there are no bad questions? Yeah, they are. There's foolish questions. It's funny when the Lord Jesus Christ, Ryan and I are going through the Gospels and uh, we're going verse by verse through Matthew. And they would come and ask the Lord Jesus Christ. The unbelievers would ask him questions. And when it was a foolish question, he knew it was a foolish question. So they'll say, what about this, that, and the other? He'll say, first, let me ask you a question. And then they'll think, because he'll catch them in their craftiness. And they couldn't answer him, or they didn't want to answer him, because he, he would catch them. And he says, well, neither would I answer you. He wasn't dealing with their foolishness. There, these questions, he, he, look, he says, foolish questions, and then genealogies. Um, you get these denominations who like to go into, you know, the roots. Anybody who talk about, let's go into the roots of this, the Hebrew roots, and all this stuff, that's just issue of genealogy, where are you from? And it's impossible to verify that stuff anyway. Notice what Paul says. Go over to 1 Timothy chapter number 1. Go over this issue of genealogies. Look at 1 Timothy chapter number 1. Paul was a Jew 
by nature. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. If anybody could take his genealogy all the way back to, if anybody could take the genealogy all the way back to Abraham, it was the Apostle Paul. Abraham is called the Hebrew, right? Both Paul's mother and his father, they both went back all the way to Abraham, untainted by any Gentile blood. Not even our Lord Jesus Christ could say that. Ruth the Moabitess was in his genealogy. But notice here, look what Paul says, verse 3, 1 Timothy 1, verse 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, so stay there in Ephesus, Asia Minor. When I went into Macedonia, that's about Acts 16, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Don't teach any doctrine but Paul's doctrine, the doctrine of the mystery of Christ. Why? Well, notice verse 4. Neither give heed to fables. Those are just things that people, stories that people make up. You know these preachers who always just got story after story after story? And they never get to actually preach in the word. Uh, fables are stories that are to teach, to teach a, uh, to teach a uh, lesson. You know who you tell fables to? Children. Children need fables, but not grown-ups. Notice he says here, don't give heed to fables. And notice he says, and endless genealogies. Paul says this stuff just goes on and on and on and on. And by the way, we all go back to Adam anyway. We all go back to Adam through Noah and his sons. Because what happens when you have all this stuff? Look at verse 4. It, which minister questions. You know, this stuff just causes more questions. Confusion. Rather than godly edifying, that's the purpose of the doctrine, to build you up in godliness which is in faith, that's the mystery, so do. And why does he command this? Look at verse 5. Now the end of the commandment, here's the purpose, the goal of this commandment, to teach you no other doctrine. Don't give in to these fables and endless genealogy. Don't get into that stuff. Watch what he says. Now the end of the commandment is charity. It's charity, how a God's love towards others, out of a pure or an innocent heart. I've learned over the years the most precious thing that I could uh, possess as a believer or you can possess as a believer is a soft heart towards God. He don't care how much doctrine you know, how long you've been in the faith, how many good works. The number one thing, he cares about all that, but the number one thing is your heart. See, charity out of a pure heart, an innocent heart, and of a good conscience, you know the, what, what's right from God's word. And of faith unfeigned, it's not phony or hypocritical. Most of our denominational brethren, they do that stuff to, to be seen of men. They go to church to say, I went to church today. Not to learn God's word. I just, to say, what are you doing? To say, I'm going to church. Okay, scrap, they put a check mark, right? Church. I went to church today. There we go. All right. I gave this much. I did this. All these little check marks, religious check marks. That's unfeigned. Uh, that, excuse me, that's feigned faith. That's fake, hypocritical. God doesn't want that. The doctrine will keep your mind pure of that. Verse 6, from which some having swerved, you ever, you ever swerved in your car, swerved to miss somebody? Or on a slick road like in Minnesota every, every winter, cars just slide off the road? You're going about your way, going 70 miles an hour, and then something happens, you got to go, you almost take the car off the road, right? I remember uh, as we, we were... We just moved here, and we had Bible study in the evening, so we'd stayed about 10, 30, 11 o'clock. And we were on a dark road, Fair Oaks Boulevard, right there in Fair Oaks, coming home. A dark, a dark stretch from San Juan over to Sunrise. No lights, no anything. Two-lane road, rolling like we did every, every Wednesday night. It's about 11 o'clock, and I'm driving, we're talking. I remember I was talking about my, my family back in Chicago, I would say something to Krista, and next thing you know, all I saw was a, a little light in, in the road, a light. It was a guy's cell phone. A drunk guy was walking in the lane, in the car lane, and I'm going about 45 miles an hour. And I can just remember, if I hadn't seen his cell phone light, I, I just did just like this went, and he would, he, I would have killed the man. He was in the road, not on the side, in the road. And I say he's going to get killed because there's other cars behind us down the road. I said, 
But I remember swerving. I said, wow, that was the most terrifying thing. I had my little baby girl and my wife. Paul says spiritually, that's what happens when people take heed to all these other things instead of the doctrine. They swerve out of the lane God wants them into and off the cliff. Look what he says. From which? From these things of a pure heart, a good conscience, the thing, uh, that, that, that lane of rectitude, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, empty, useless, rattling. It's just, that's all it is. It's just foolish talk. That's what you're getting in these denominations and religions. Why? Verse 7. Because desiring to be teachers of the what? The law. That's religion. That's denominationalism. That's performance-based acceptance before God. And you know these guys who teach, want to be teachers of the law? Understanding neither what they say, they have no clue what they're talking about, nor, nor where they affirm. They're putting this stuff into people not knowing that they're destroying these people's faith. Paul says, don't do that. Go back to Titus. Go back over to Titus. So he says, verse 9, but avoid those foolish questions. Those genealogies, he calls them endless genealogies. By the way, there's only one person whose genealogy matters, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why Matthew, Luke, Mark doesn't give a genealogy because he's the suffering servant. You don't need to know a servant's lineage. But Matthew shows him back to David, the king, and Abraham. Luke shows him as the son of God going all the way back to Adam. And John doesn't have a genealogy because he shows him as God. Jehovah is salvation. Uh, Jehovah is gracious. Shows him as God. But for king and for the man, it has this genealogy because it matters. Because he is the, the seed of the woman that God promised Adam and Eve. So he, has, he goes back there in Luke. He is the, 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 the promised seed of Abraham, the promised seed of David. So we see his lineage. That's the only genealogy you need to know about. And contentions. Contentions just debates, just going back and forth. You know, I, I look at social media today, mm -hmm. and boy, it can get contentious, can it? Because mm -hmm. that's not the right medium. It's not the best medium to deal with the tough things of God's word. Mm -hmm. The contentious, so you avoid them, he says. <laughs> yeah, he talks about strivings about the law. In Paul's day, that was huge because the, the, the people of Israel still had that law. The temple was still up, and, and, and they would try to bring the law in. And, and Paul says, don't, don't strive with him on that. Focus on God's grace. It's still, it's still big today, right. It's denominationalism, right. That's how, it, thank, you, thank you, Brother Kent. That is, uh, Brother John's talking about today, it's people going back into the law program, right, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or the Old Testament, or even the Hebrew epistles down under the law, and striving about them. But look what he says, why we avoid in verse 9 at the end. For they are unprofitable and vain. They're empty and they're useless. And Paul is talking like a businessman. He says those first things, they're profitable. These things, they're unprofitable. Why even deal with them? Okay? Now look at verse 10. What if you have that guy who wants to contend with you, strive with you? What if he's a brother in the Lord? Now he's talking about brothers in the Lord. If they some lost dude, don't even worry about it. Who cares? But if, what if they're a brother in the Lord? Notice in verse 10, a man that is an heretic. You could be in the body of Christ and considered a heretic. And that's what we're going to look at today. He says, after the first and second admonition, that's how you know they're a brother, because we are, we are to admonish one another. We're not to admonish lost people. They're lost. They need to get saved. But we're trying to recover another brother in Christ. Now, notice what Paul says. After the first, you're being gracious to them. And the second, you give it to them. They come back at you. You say, nope, here, here, here's what God's word says, brother. If they want to fight about it, let them go. Reject them. Why? Knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, he's in sin, being condemned him of himself. At that judgment seat of Christ, he's going to suffer loss. But let's go back to this issue of heresy. That issue of heresy, go with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 24. Before you go there, go to uh, Galatians. Go to Galatians 5. We'll get up to Acts. I want to show you something. When we, when we think about Galatians 5, 
you probably think about the fruit of the spirit. We have children. Um, Brenda has young children. The Kents have young children. We have a young daughter. My wife's with them right now. And, and each, each Sunday, we go over what, what Chris is going to go, go over, Galatians 5. I put the verses together for them. And um, she'll say, here's the topic, here's the theme I want to teach the children. I want to do this crap. Get the verses. That's my thing. I say, what do you want to talk about? Boom, I give them to her. But she teaches the children about the fruit of the Spirit. And she goes through all the fruit of the Spirit, right? But there's something called the works of the flesh in contrast. And I want you to see, uh, we're all familiar with uh, the fruit of the Spirit. Look at verse 22. And this is big. Krista likes to teach the children this. Uh, what, what produces godly character? Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit. And then we get verses on love and joy and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there's no law. And so each week she'll grab one of those and teach the children that. But this is, that, that, look at verse 22 starts with a but. That's in contrast with what he talks about earlier. Look at verse 19. Look at Galatians 5, 19. Now the works of the flesh are are manifest, which are these? Adultery. Ryan and I, we, we talk about how Satan just twists words, corrupt words. You know we're called adults in our culture. We're never, mankind is not called, an, a, a grown person is not called an adult in the Bible. That's too, why, why that word, adult? Yeah, because you just put the ER right there. There are a lot of words in our, in our, in our culture, especially. You go, where, where did that word come from? Look how close that word is to adultery. <laughs> so every time we call ourselves adult, adult, adultery, it, it makes sense, yeah. We talk about kids. Kids are just uh, uh, sin, sin, sin offerings in the Bible. It's just funny. If you start thinking about the words and just how subtle it is, uh, Christmas, right? Christ, Mass. That's what the Roman Catholics do. To make it subtle, you just kind of take the S off. See, little thing, even that, adultery, that's a bad thing. So we make it a good thing, just take that off to hide and call them adult. Because that's where the word is from, adult, adultery. Isn't that interesting? Just little things like that to think about. That's the work of the flesh. Look at verse 19. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft. That everything is Hollywood, right? You go through. I was say witchcraft, right? Think about it. In, 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 in Jada Lynn's little play, The Wizard of Oz, I had to explain to my little girl. She's a little actress. I explained fantasy versus reality. But I said I, I went to. I, I looked at all the verses on the wizard. In the Bible, wizard is a bad thing. In the Bible, witchcraft is a bad thing. John and I were talking. That Wizard of Oz is trying to show. It's trying to demean our Lord. He's back there pulling levers and stuff, but he has no power, right? The yellow brick road, the streets of gold in heaven, that type of stuff. I see all the symbolism. You can do it yourself. God is the one who's supposed to give you courage from his word. No, I can do it myself. God is the one to give you a mind to think with 10 minutes. No, I can do it myself. God is the one to get you to your destiny home, Dorothy. I can do it myself. It's, the power is all in me. That's the whole thing, right? Who's the other one? Scarecrow. Mm -hmm. the courage, a heart. Who's going to give you the right heart? I, it's all it's in me. See, it, it's, it's, take, it's kind of demeaning what our Lord's power can do. Witchcraft. I watched this show growing up. Uh, what's the one? Bewitched. It still comes on. Old time TV. Where Samantha and her daughter, her, her, her mother's name is Endora. Mm -hmm. You know Endora? She's the witch of Endor in the Bible. Her name is in, in the witch of Endor. That's where they got the name from over in the Old Testament with, 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 uh, in Samuel when Saul went to the witch of Endor. And they take something the Bible says is bad and make it good. We talk about pride. Hmm? Mocking the they're mocking the Bible. Yes, that's what they're doing. Satan is leading them to mock the Bible. Yes, they're mocking. That's, right with, that's what they're doing. Pride. We're proud to be an American. Pride in the Bible is one of the top sins that Almighty God feels is an abomination. 
The Bible uses the word well-pleased. It's how Satan has turned these words into something that we're very comfortable and positive about, but they're bad in the Bible. They're mocking the Bible. Look at verse number 19. There's adultery. I'm sorry, verse 20. Idolatry, worship of the gods, witchcraft, hatred. Hate is going to hate, hate, hate. That's what our girl says, right? Oh, Taylor Swift. But you know what? That's a, that's a work of the flesh. Hatred is poison, man. It's poison. It'll destroy you from the inside out. God doesn't want us to be haters. He says they're haters and hate one another. We're to be lovers. Hater, hatred, variance. That has to do with you just constantly want to be at variance. It quarrels with fo folks. Emula em uh, emulations, you know, uh, desiring to uh, uh, be like others and, and, and follow in their ways. Wrath, strife, seditions. All these things to undermine uh, others. And, 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 and in verse 20, Paul mentions heresies. Heresies. That is a work of the flesh. Go back to Acts 24. Let me show you what Paul says about it here in Acts 24. It's Luke's recording of what Paul talks about. Look at Acts chapter 24. Paul is once again under persecution. He's being brought before all of these councils. He's being charged with all type of false charges. They're just making stuff up, trying to see what sticks. Because they're unrighteous. And in Acts chapter 24, verse 10. So he's before the governor. Acts 24, verse 10. Then Paul, after that, the governor had beckoned unto him to speak. So he says, okay, now you can defend yourself, Paul. Answer, for as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation. Look at Paul's kindness even before this heathen. This unbeliever, let's say it like that. I do more, excuse me, verse 10. I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. Paul was more than capable to defend himself. Verse 11, because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship. Remember, Paul would still go back to Jerusalem to worship with his people Israel at the temple and to teach them about the Lord Jesus Christ. That was his main thing. But when he was around the Jews, he was as of a Jew. First Corinthians nine. OK, let's keep going. Verse 12. So he, he, when he's, he's thinking back to when he was at Jerusalem. And they, that's the Jews there, neither found me in the temple disputing with any man. Paul had such reverence for the temple that God had Solomon built that he refused to dispute with them in the temple. He disputed with them, by the way, but he'd leave the temple and go into other places, houses and a school of Tyrannus and so forth. But Paul's reverence for the holy temple, the, re the respect he had for it, he wasn't willing to, to do all that there. Notice verse number 12. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people. Paul wasn't trying to raise an uproar. You know what they do in the Middle East now? They just want to go to the Temple Mount and their side raise an uproar and their side raise an uproar. Paul says, no, 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 we don't do that. Watch this. Neither in the synagogue. So not just in the temple, but where the Jews would congregate. Nor in the city. Paul says, I wasn't causing trouble. Verse number 13. Neither can they, what's that next word? Prove the things whereof they now accuse me. Remember I said all those false charges? No proof. They didn't have any evidence that Paul did any of that. So much so, like with the Lord, they would have to bring false witnesses. Thou shalt not bear false witness, God says. It's punishable by death. Look at this. Verse 14. But this I confess unto thee, talking to the governor, that after the way that they call what? Heresy. See, they were accusing Paul of being a heretic. So worship I the God of my fathers, believing, what's that next word? All things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. That's what's going to happen. But I want you to see this word all. What, what Paul is going to say is that 
if you're not giving all the counsel of Almighty God, that's heresy. Because what Satan does, he just gives some. You're to give all. And, and even the denominations, they only focus on the earthly ministry of Christ or the prophetic program. And they don't focus also on the mystery program. It is sad. Go back, to, go back to Acts chapter 20. Look when Paul was talking to the Ephesian elders before he was leaving. Look at Acts chapter 20, verse 26 and 27. See, what heresy is, it's not focusing on all that God has given in his word. A man that is an heretic, it doesn't mean he rejects everything. What it means is he's not willing to look at. He's not willing to speak about it in, case, in, in, the, in the case of a teacher about everything that is listed in God's word. He's picking and choosing. He's purposely ignoring certain things. That's why I go verse by verse through Paul's epistles so we won't miss anything. We look at all of God's word rightly divided. Let me show you something. Look at Acts chapter 20 and verse number. Yeah, let's look at verse 25. And now behold, I know that ye all, Paul right, Paul says to them, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. He's going to go. They won't see him. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. Paul says, I fulfilled my ministry. I told people what God wants me to tell them. It's on them now. Can't make them believe, but I gave them the truth. How do we know that? Look at verse 20, 27. For I, excuse me, for I have not shunned. That word shun is a beautiful word. That means he didn't turn his back on it, on, on all the truth that God gave him. People turn their back. We call it a truth governor. Some people only go so far, they don't want the rest of it. No, nah, that's okay, that's okay, that's okay. Paul says, no, nah, I didn't do that. For I have not shunned, to, as far as a teacher, I have not shunned to declare unto you. What? All the counsel of God. Do you know, this is going to, this is going to, y'all sitting down? There are ministers in denominations right now who know about Paul's message, the mystery. And they refuse to teach it because if they do, they're going to have to suffer for Christ's sake. And they're not willing to suffer right now. They just don't understand that judgment seat. I can tell you that they will suffer loss. Yeah. Did, let me say that again. There are men in the body of Christ in pulpits who know about the mystery of Christ and refuse to teach it because they want to build their ministry up. And you, if you're teaching the mystery of Christ, it's going to look like this. Filthy lucre sake. Look at Colossians. Go over to Colossians chapter 1. Paul says, now that God has given the mystery of Christ, every minister, every saint needs to know this truth, this doctrine. And if your preacher, your teacher is not teaching all of God's word, it's okay. We, Ryan and I are going through the four gospels right now doing a commentary, but we make it known who, is, who, are, who are those, those books written to, who are they speaking to, and we make it known who Paul is speaking to us Gentiles for today. Notice in Colossians chapter 1, verse number 25, Colossians 1, 25, whereof I am made a minister according to or in line with the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill or to bring to, bring to fullness the what? The word of God. We, we already had in the Old Testament and so forth, and then the four Gospels, what Paul, what Paul called, uh, what the Bible calls prophecy or the prophetic program, the prophetic program with Israel and the earth and so forth. OK, that was made known. Old Testament, uh, Genesis through Malachi, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and Acts. But when you come to your Bible, Romans through Philemon, Paul's epistles, it's called the mystery. This is the prophetic program for the earth. This is the mystery program for the heavens, for the heavenly places, right? For the heavens. And then after this is done, after we're gone, you got the Hebrews through Revelation. That's the prophetic program again. That's how you rightly divide the word. 
And my point is, Paul says, you got to let people know all of this stuff. You can't hide. And if you're not, you're an heretic. You're hiding these things. Yeah, it's wild. Notice what he says right here. Verse 26, even the mystery, that is particularly the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations. But now, that's in the dispensation of grace, is made manifest to his what? Saints. Don't try to share this with people right up front. You need to make sure they're a saint. You need to make sure they're saved. A lot of time when you're trying to share right division with people and they're just not getting it, it's because they're lost. It's because they're lost. They don't have the spirit of God. Notice, God wants it manifest to his saints. I always tell you, Mark is here. I'll tell focus on making clear the gospel of grace as far as salvation. Right, Mark? Because you want to make sure they're saved. You can't minister the mystery to a lost person. They got to manifest to his saints. To whom? To the saints. God would make known what is the riches of the glory, talk about that hope of glory, of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. That's more than just being saved. Y'all know that? That's more than just being in Christ. Christ in you, that's a sanctification issue. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You must build Christ in you in order to obtain that glory of God, that reigning. And so why, what does Paul do? He give his life over to it. Verse 28, whom we preach. See what preaching is? Warning every man. So you warn brothers and sisters in Christ. Said, hey, don't lose out. But you just don't warn them. If we just told our children the negative things, hey, I, I'm warning, I'm a spank, I'm a spank, and you don't tell them what to do right, that's not being a good parent. So God says, I warn you, but I'm going to teach you too. We teach our children and teaching every man. And what type of wisdom? All wisdom. There's the wisdom of God in prophecy. And then there's the wisdom of God in the mystery. First Corinthians 1. Go over to um, uh, 2 Peter 3. Go over to 2 Peter 3. Look what Peter says to Israel. Notice in 2 Peter 3, they say, Peter, where's the kingdom? Where's the kingdom? He promised us a kingdom. It's been 4,000 years since Adam. Where is the kingdom? Where? Now 6,000. Where's the kingdom? 2 Peter 3. Peter says, verse 15, an account, do the math, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is what? Salvation. He's trying to get folks saved. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you. He's talking about the wisdom of God and mystery. Peter says, you know, Paul got some wisdom from God that we didn't get. And now that Paul, his mystery has fulfilled the word of God, even the mystery. If you're teaching God's word, you need to teach both programs, the word rightly divided. If you are a believer, go back to uh, Titus. Oh, before we go back to Titus 3, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Remember how we saw in Galatians that heresy is, is, a, is a work of the flesh? Heresy caused divisions. The Corinthians were, were uh, filled with heresy and heretics. Uh, look at verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 18. Uh, 1 Corinthians, pardon me. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verse 18. Verse 18, for first of all, when ye come together in the church, so when, they, when they gather together like we're doing, Paul heard from the house of, uh, of, of Chloe, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. <laughs> Paul knew them. By the way, his, his, his kindness was like, all right, I don't, take, I don't take everything I hear, you know, it's face value, but I partly believe it. I know you guys. You know. That shows you how to deal with people. 
believe none, almost none of what you hear. Is that the, the way they say that? Paul, when it comes to saints, he gave him benefit of doubt. He goes, now nah, I hear more than this. I partly believe it, though. He was being kind to him. He knew that there were divisions. He started to check the book off with it. Verse 19, for there must be also heresies. Among. He, he, sets, he, 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 co he connects these divisions to heresies. And what happened, people would say, nope, this is the way we should go. Follow this man. No, we need to follow this guy's doctrine. No, follow this guy. Follow this guy. They were men followers. But God allowed it so that those who would shine the truth of his rightly divided word could be manifest. For there must, verse 19, also be also heresies among you that they which are approved. And how do you show yourself approved unto God? 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. In that sea of confusion, I talked to a sister in the Lord from D.C., Washington, D.C., and boy, she felt it. I told her, I said, you're in the den of iniquity there. You think being in Sacramento, California area, the capital here, that Satan has stronghold. This is just one state, even though it's the worst. She, she's living in the capital of the country, really, of, America, of, of the world right now, the superpower. And all of this stuff is going on. She's telling me about it. I'm saying, yeah, you're just in a den of iniquity there. She was talking about how it was tougher to find a place to rightly, where she could fellowship with mm -hmm. and, and, and how she could feel the satanic uh, hindrance from not having a, a, an assembly to keep her strong. Mm -hmm. And I felt, I could, yeah, I go, it's true. But anyway, she, it, it says about the approved, right? God wants you to know all of God's word rightly divided. Um, go back to Titus, if you will, when he talks about a man that is inherited. So now you have someone. In this case, it's probably someone who's in a position of teaching, because that's what Titus was going to, to deal with. If he's teaching the things that are not consistent with all of God's word rightly divided, right, rightly divided. As a brother in the Lord, Titus was to go and then admonish him. And what admonishment is, it's gentle. It's, it's almost like a gentle condemnation. You're dealing with them gently, but you're dealing with them. Admonish them as a brother. It's, he says over the Thessalonians, he says, he says, treat them not like an enemy, but admonish them as a brother. It's like a gentle warning. That's what it is. You go to this man and say, look here, bro. You're out of line because of this, this, and this. You're not, you're, you're not consistent. You're not teaching, showing both sides of this issue from the word. You give it to him. He says, no, no, I, I disagree, brother. You show him again. Titus knew the rightly divided word. Notice when he says reject. You let him go. You see the word eject in there like when those pilots come in. The plane goes down. That's what you do to him. You shoot him out. Reject him. Yep, and keep going, just let him go. Why do you do that? Knowing that he that is such, if, he, if he's that heretic, is subverted. That's the opposite of being built up. He's actually going in the opposite, subverted. Turn, he's turned, turned over. And he's sinning, he's sinning. You know, people think just because Christ died for our sins, that none of the sins we commit after salvation affect us well, that, that at the judgment seat of Christ, that's just craziness. Not only do they affect you there, they affect you now. If you live a life of sin now, it has a devastating effect on you now. It's called spiritual sowing and reaping. If you sow to flesh, you reap corruption. If you sow to the spirit, you reap life everlasting, Galatians 6. But more importantly, if you're sinning now, Paul is more concerned about the judgment seat of Christ. Let me show you that. Get a couple passages. Go to um, 1 Timothy Chapter 5. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. I told my wife, Krista, it's a blessing and a curse to know a lot of verses. Because at any good time, I told you how in Star Wars, you know, they were on this platform and all these space vehicles were flying back and forth. That's how my mind is with the verses. They're always flying back and forth. I, I'm trying to catch one here. So as I'm thinking about one verse, I got like six of them sitting right there flying by. I, it's, it's a trip. It's a blessing 
because I got the God's word, but it's a curse too, because I'm thinking about I'm thinking about two other ones already. So if I pause, it's because I'm trying to figure out which one to go to. Uh, First Timothy chapter five, this issue of he sinneth. And that verse in Titus says being condemned of himself. There's condemnation there. Notice here, look at uh, First Timothy chapter five. Verse number 24 and 25. You're going to see both sides of the coin at the judgment seat of Christ. Notice this. Some men's sins, some men's what? Sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment. In other words, you can see clearly that brother's lifestyle is a sinful lifestyle, and it's going to the judgment seat of Christ. But what about the sum you can't see? Verse number 24. And some men, they, talking about the sins, follow after. You may not know they're living that simple lifestyle, but the righteous judge does. And it ain't hiding. He ain't hiding nothing. But what about the good works? If you focus on the good works, it is a weightier thing with God. Remember that study? He weighs these things out. I'll show you that in a moment. Look at verse 25. Likewise, also, see, God is gracious. He's not just focused on sin. This is unrepentant sin is what he's talking about. Likewise, also, the good works of some are manifest beforehand. You can look at that brother or sister and say, that's a saint uh, filled with good works. They're just fruit abound in their account. We can see it. But there are saints who serve the Lord that we don't even know about. Verse number 25, likewise, also, the good works of some are manifest beforehand. And they that are otherwise, in other words, where you can't see the good works, cannot be hid. What does that mean? Go over to 1 Corinthians. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. What it means it cannot be hid is one day both of those things are coming out to the light. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. If you want to know what it means to, to, to worship the Lord with fear and trembling, Philippians 2, Paul says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's this. It's knowing that everything you do will have a spotlight on it, good or bad. Manifest. It will make manifest. It manifests like, here's a peer, bam. We shall all appear before the, manifest, uh, before the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to be made manifest, right? Look at this. Look at um, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. Paul says, therefore judge nothing before the time. What time is that? That's the judgment seat of Christ. Until the Lord come. And when he calls him the Lord, he, the focus is the righteous, what? Judge. Who both will bring to light. Remember he says, they that are otherwise cannot be hid. Who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness. Wow. Assistant of the Lord, I'm going to answer this question and doing a Q&A. Facebook. About that judgment seat of Christ, the great white throne, excuse me, the great white throne judgment. Because she feels the way we do. You see all the evilnesses in the world and, and, and people taking advantage of it. And, you, and, and, you, and they, you get no justice in this world. And, and I have to remind myself and I tell Chris, I go, they're not getting away with anything. The righteous judge, he's watching this. The angels are recording this. It's coming back on them. And one day we're going to judge them. We're going to be there with them. I'll show you that. See, Paul says... The hidden things of darkness, verse 5, and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. God's going to read your heart out and say, here's why you did what you did. You could do good things for the wrong reason, and he's going to bring that out. The motivation. Look at that. He that searches the heart. He's going to look at why you did what you did. Oh, that's why I told you. The, the best thing you can have, the most important thing is an innocent, pure heart before the Lord because he looks at your motivations. You could do good things with the wrong motivation or you could do something that people say, oh, that's not good, but it has the right heart motivation. Interesting. Interesting. People say, well, you can't do that. Oh, if I'm serving a, a person, a saint, oh, yeah, I can. The Lord Jesus Christ got accused of doing everything, breaking all type of laws. You know that? And they wouldn't look at why he did what he did. Oh, this is on the Sabbath. He says, but I'm healing a man. Shut up. That's right. See, God looks at the counsels of the heart. Notice here. 
But at the end of that judgment seat, verse five, and then shall every man have what? Praise of God. You know, in chapter five, I want as we come down to the end. If you don't think the sins when he says such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. First Corinthians five is a perfect example of that. Look at this chapter five, verse one. It is reported. I can't read this without feeling the intensity of what's going to happen to this guy if he didn't recover himself. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as it is not so much as named among the Gentiles. And what was that? That one should have his father's wife. This man was a, a, a brother in the Lord, most likely a minister. It's kind of in the context of ministry. He was doing a sin so grievous that the heathen Gentiles around him who were given the fornication, you got to get this, the Gentiles are given over to fornication. And they saying, man, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't have your father's wife. Come on, man. When the heathen who that's their thing, look at somebody who a follower of Christ or whatever. That's how they look at a Christian. They say he has his father's wife. We don't even do that. That's what he's saying. Check this out. And such fornication, verse one, as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father. When the world looks at you as a believer and say, we don't even do that crazy stuff. Woo. That's how bad it was. Once you have his father's word. Verse two, and ye are puffed up. I always ask myself, wh why were they puffed up? Once saved, always saved. Yeah. Paul explained they got they got the grace message, at least the salvation part. They couldn't lose it. So let's just do whatever we can. Just sin so that grace may abound. That's what the guy was teaching. Notice, but ye are puffed up and hath not rather mourned. You use that word mourning when, when like with a death. They should have said that brother is dying spiritually. Paul says they're, 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 they're celebrating this sin. Look at it. That he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. That's like the last resort. If you got to the point where you had to kick someone out because of that, Paul had already, through back channels, I'm sure, tried to work with this guy. I know he did. That's the last resort. It takes a long time to get to that point. Interesting. Let's keep going. Verse three, for I verily as absent in the body. So Paul wasn't there at the time, but present in spirit have judged already. Paul's a righteous judge. He, he, he saw the situation. He says, here's what you got to do. Since y'all not going to do it, I'm going to do it. As though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, his authority as the righteous judge. When ye are gathered together, he just assumed they gather, okay? He didn't say, do y'all gather together? Yeah, you do, okay. And my spirit. So this was some type of apostolic thing going on here that he got, he got, he got power from the Lord to do. With the power, of, I, when I think about this, I think about, I know I, I make Ryan laugh when I, I know nothing about Star Wars, but I saw the, the last one. And so they'll be talking about something, then this hologram will just appear there. Their master, right? I'm messing up. He's probably left. And there's some hologram up here. They're talking to him. And then he just. Mm. That's how I kind of sense this, that Paul's spirit is just there monitoring. This is just amazing. Watch this. He said, he says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together and my spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus. So something was going on by the spirit of God here to deliver. This is like they were having a council to deliver such a one unto who? Satan. Give him to Satan. That's the last thing God ever wants to deliver one of his children to Satan. But he, he had a reason for doing it. Look, for the destruction of the what? The flesh. This guy was sinning so much, he says, go ahead. Just give him over to Satan. Let him destroy this man's flesh. That the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. That's, that's eternal security. Well, here's what he's talking about. He's looking. Great question, Dodi. Uh, uh, don't he mention eternal security. He's not going to lose his salvation. He'd be saved. Your soul is by fire. But here's the period. He didn't say his soul. Great. People have this question, so that's good. Notice he, he didn't say that his soul may be saved, right? Mm -hmm. See, we're a spirit. We're a soul and body. In other words, a, a, a soul with a body and a spirit. 
He, this is already saved forever, your soul, okay? He's, he, he's, he's saved. Your body, that you're going to get your new body, so that's going to be saved. That's going to be, you're going to get a new body, okay? But that goes into the grave before the thing, if you die before the rest. The issue at the judgment seat of Christ is a spiritual issue, right? I'll just put spiritual. What, what's being dealt with at the judgment seat of Christ is where the spirit of God and the word of God has been built up. So what he's saying is he's trying to recover this man so that he won't suffer loss at the judgment seat of Christ. He's not saying his soul might be saved because he's saved, his spirit. It has to do with his, 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 the, uh, the, the reward or loss thereof. Yes. So Paul was so concerned. I, here's, as we end, we got to end. But look at, this, look at what he wants you to see. When Paul says that her, heretic is sinning, condemned of himself, He's so concerned, the Apostle Paul, at, for at the judgment seat of Christ. That's his focus. He's saying, forget this world here. That's not the true focus. It's the judgment seat of Christ. He was so concerned that the Lord not take care of this guy. Everybody get that? If, if, you, if you had to choose, this is what Paul is saying. I guess I'm, you got Satan on one hand and the Lord Jesus on, on the other. Paul would say, if you have to choose which one you want to deal with you, you better choose this one right here. Yeah. Don't mess around with this guy. No, I know. Watch this. Get, we got two verses. Get uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and 1 Thessalonians 4. Matthew, you put this in your thing about the righteous judge. You put it in that, in that thing. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. You know why Paul, Paul, didn't, Paul loved this man. Paul loved that brother. Paul mourned for that brother. He says, look, I hate to do this. He being like the prodigal father of Luke, let him go. Let the world, let Satan beat up on him, hoping he'd humble himself. He wants to humble him and come back. But, but he said, the, the Lord is more terrible than Satan is. You want Satan dealing with you to recover you. You don't want the, the righteous judge to deal with you. I'm going to show you that. Look at, look at 2 Corinthians 5. When he talks about fear and trembling, he means fear and trembling. Look at this. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done, whether it be what? Good or bad. Do you want the Lord, did Paul want the Lord giving that guy back that, that sin that he was doing? No. He'd be ashamed and lose the reward. So then before you get to that point, verse 11, knowing therefore the what of the Lord? Terror. The terror of the Lord. God is love. Jesus is so sweet. And so, yeah, he is. But when he's that righteous judge on that, white, on that throne and the great white throne, justice. it's all about justice and judgment. Don't call it the Bema seat because that's going to take away from the issue of judgment. It's not just a, a, a reward award ceremony going on. There's the terror of the Lord. Paul only used that word terror in two places. For rulers are not a terror against good works but the evil. And he's talking about the rulers who got the power to kill you. One more verse as we end. I just, I, it's not being taught. I'm not, I'm not going to give Herod. I'm going to give it all. I'm just going to give it to you. I'm not going to beat around the bush because people want to avoid the judgment. How many times, you, if you come from a denomination, how many times your preacher, not just the series on the judgment seat of Christ, even mention in a message the judgment seat of Christ? This is a fantastic tool to help you in your Bible study. I, we give these charts out, right division chart. And I agree with almost all of it. There's a few things I changed. The dispensation of fullness of times is not accurately recorded. But look at this. Look, there's judgments. Look at here. There's, uh, okay, there's uh, Antichrist on his throne, the Lord Jesus on his throne in the, in the kingdom, the, the great white throne. But even our brothers missed this one. There's no throne for the judgment seat of Christ. The biggest throne should be right there, the judgment seat of Christ for the believer today. Mm -hmm. So if we redid that, we put that throne big right there. Mm -hmm. 
beautiful thing, great tool, but even our brothers missed it who made this. You know why? Because it's not taught. Go over to 1 Thessalonians 4 and we're going to end. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I've gotten so much feedback since we focused in these last days on the judgment seat of Christ. It has motivated saints to get serious about their walk and their service for the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse number 1. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus. When you hear that word, Lord Jesus, what do you think about? The righteous judge. That as ye have received of us, that's Paul and Timotheus and Silas, how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. Paul didn't say, hey, you're pleasing God, that's good. He's going, you're pleasing God, that's good. Keep going. Push it. For, verse 2, for ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Paul get, Christ gave Paul grace commandments for us. For, it is, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you shall abstain from fornication. <laughs> the Lord, he says, abstain from fornication. This guy was fornicating in 1 Corinthians 5. He was doing stuff that, the, I mean, he's out of the will of God. Verse 4, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel, that's his physical body, in sanctification and in honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, just given over to lasciviousness, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Now, here, here, here it is right here. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in what? Any matter. Because that the Lord is the what? Avenger. Now I can hit the pulpit, John. The Avenger. It's not Captain America. It's the Avenger of all such as we are forewarned and testify. For God has not called us unto uncleanness but unto holy. That word avenger is such a strong word. You see, it, it, it has the issue of revenge in it. And as we end, if you go and look at the Old Testament, the only other time it's used, there was a man, there was, there was a concept called the avenger of blood. And if you killed someone's family member, according to the law, the judges had the right to allow you as their relative to take vengeance. You were called the avenger of blood. You took my family person, my, my loved one's life, I'm taking yours. And it was by law. Christ used the same word to describe how he will deal with saints at the judgment seat if they harm other saints. It's the, it has that same passion. Think about that. A word only used in the Old Testament so that you can go and kill somebody who was a murderer righteously, the Lord is going to use that same intensity when dealing with saints on how they deal with other saints. It's so important how we deal with one another as saints is the point. If you're listening today, if the Lord Jesus Christ is that, ter uh, 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 that terrible in a good way towards his own saints, when they have unrepented sin that goes before the judgment. If they willingly choose to be heretics or to walk in sinful lifestyles, willingly, not because of weakness. If he's willing to be like that with his own members of his body, how much grievous would it be for someone who rejects him? If you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior, There's the terror of the Lord. It is so terrible, the punishment of rejecting the very person who died for you, that it's almost impossible to put in words. So let me just say this. Trust the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the righteous judge. He died on the cross to pay for your sins. He's very serious about human souls. Let him be the savior. You be the sinner that he died for. Trust him. And if you saved today or if you just got saved, now work out your salvation on salvation with fear and trembling. It's not the, uh, walking on eggshells. It has, it's, it's a reverence for him. It's saying, Lord, you're right. I'm wrong. I want to serve you. That's how you serve the Lord. But it, it, is a, it, is a, it is a healthy respect like you have for electricity or should have if you don't. 
you should. Well, the same reverence and more you should have for the righteous judge, okay? We'll help you ha learn how to walk and to please God through the ministry here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your glorious truths. We thank you for your truth made manifest in a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we thank you for your truth made manifest uh, in writing through the holy scriptures, Father. Each day, Father, and, and, and publicly with these saints, I say, let us have a greater appreciation of your son. And part of that, yea, the main part is that because of what he did to serve you, you've made him the righteous judge where every knee shall bow and every tongue shall, shall confess that Jesus is Lord. And so, Father, we need to give him the honor and respect that he's due. If there are lost people out there, they're going to have to bow down to him. It's better to bow down to him in him than outside of him. May they get saved. And for those of us who are already in him, who trusted him as our savior, let us bow down to him and have him say, stand up, thou good and faithful servant. Here is your reward. Here is your crown of righteousness, which I'll give you because of your service for me. May that be the heart attitude of all of us here and those listening, Father. May we work to that end until you come. May it be through your word and your spirit that it's accomplished. We thank you for that in Christ's name. Amen.